Well, welcome to this online service of Cumbernauld Free Church. My name's Andy, and it's my joy to welcome everyone tuning in online, especially if this is your first time. We want to extend a very warm Cumbernauld welcome to you. This is the third Sunday of Advent, and we've been doing a little mini-series through the four titles given to us in Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6. And this week we come to our third title, Everlasting Father, and uh, in this service we're going to meditate and uh, think about what that means for us, that Jesus Christ is our Everlasting Father. We're going to begin this service by singing uh, a great Christmas carol to, to God's praise. our heads and let's join our hearts together in prayer. Let's pray. Our Father, you are in heaven high and lifted up, higher than our highest thoughts. Holy is your name. Besides you there is no other. You are God and you alone. Our Father, you are rich in mercy, splendid in grace. Wisdom and justice go before you. Peace and righteousness are at your right hand. Lord Jesus, to see you is to see the Father. To know you is to know the Father. We pray that as your children, We may love one another so that people will know and recognise that we truly are your children. Help us never to do anything from rivalry or conceit, but in humility counting others is more significant than ourselves. Help us not to look only to our own interests, but to the interests of others. Holy and merciful Father, we confess to you our forgetfulness and our waywardness. Lord, we are sinful. Lord, we often forget your past acts of love and faithfulness. And we often are prone to forget the moments where we fail you. And so in 
humility and brokenness, we pray that you'd forgive us. Crown us again with your acceptance and care. Satisfy the real thirst of our soul. Redeem us from our slavery to ourselves in our own way. Renew us with strength that only you can give. Reveal yourself to us as a God of grace, rich in mercy, patient with our wandering. As far as the rising sun is from the setting sun, remove our sin from us. Or we confess our lives are dust, our existence is temporary, our breath a gift from you. But you, God, are eternal. You, God, are the rock forevermore. You are the giver of every good and perfect gift. And we pray that, God, you'd put a song in our hearts today as we seek to worship you and glorify you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you've got your Bible there, it'd be great if you could open it up at Isaiah chapter 9 and we're going to read uh, verse 2 down to verse 7. So let's hear the word of God. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. You've enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as men rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the days of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, And the government will be on his shoulders and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness. From that time on and forever, the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Amen. And may God bless this reading from his holy word.
So we're continuing in our sermon series in Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6 and uh, we're looking at the four titles of Christ given there over the four Sundays of Advent. We've already looked at Jesus as our wonderful counsellor and as mighty God and this Sunday we're thinking of Jesus as our everlasting Father. Now there are few words in the English language that evoke such widespread emotional reaction than the word father. So for some of you watching, no doubt as you think of your earthly father, positive thoughts and feelings rise to the surface. You think of your earthly dad and you think of how much you love him for all that he's done for you, all that he's doing for you, all that you look forward uh, doing with him. Perhaps some of you have lost your earthly uh, father, but you still uh, have great and precious and fond memories of your time with him. Then for others of us, when we think of our earthly father, it's not positive the feelings we have or thoughts, they're negative. Perhaps the most pain we've experienced in this life is because of our relationship with our earthly father or our lack of relationship. So some of us perhaps have experienced an earthly father who's been mean and abusive, who's been physically present but in all ways absent mentally, never encouraged, never built up, never spent time with us. Or perhaps some of us have had that experience of being abandoned by our earthly father. So this term, it evokes such widespread emotional feeling. Then the term father itself, it can be used in different ways. So we can speak of Albert Einstein as the father of modern physics or Sigmund Freud as the father of modern psychoanalysis or Darwin as the father of evolution and so on and so forth. And in that sense, we're using father to mean someone who is uh, an initiator or an innovator. Then we can uh, use the term father to speak of a leader, of a king. So in the ancient world, in the Hebrew culture, that's certainly how they use the the, the term father to speak of a a leader, an elder. Um, The Americans, the, the, the founding father of their country is George Washington, and then they speak of the founding fathers. So, so, so father can be uh, used to mean leader, ruler, founder. So, so it evokes different emotional reactions. It's used in different ways. I highlight that because as we come to Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, And as we look together at Jesus as our everlasting Father, I am sure we're going to see that it is different meanings, or it's used in different ways, but it will also provoke a a reaction. God willing, not just an emotional reaction, but ultimately a spiritual reaction. For us to rest our faith and our trust and our confidence in him and in him alone. You see, what I'm going to argue this morning is that all that is expected and hoped for in our earthly fathers is ultimately, truly, only found and fulfilled in the coming and the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. So no matter if you have sweet thoughts regarding your earthly father, it's a shadow of Jesus Christ as the everlasting father. Or if you have bitter thoughts and unmet longings with regards to your earthly father, I want to show that ultimately they could only ever be met in Jesus, our everlasting father. Our earthly fathers cannot, will not compare with him because he's everything we've ever dreamed a father could be. Everything we've ever wanted in a relationship with our earthly father is what is given to us in Jesus Christ. Now, before we look at this prophetic title and what it means, I want to begin by telling us what it does not mean when it's applied to Jesus. And it's important we do that because this title, in in some ways, is, is, is complex. I'm sure you'd agree. At first glance... This feels like a rather strange title for the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not what we tend to think about when we think of Jesus, is it? Because when we think Father, we think of our Heavenly Father. We think of the first person of the Trinity. 
And when we think of Jesus, we think the Son of God, the, the second person of the Trinity. And so the question that perhaps emerges in our minds is this. How can Jesus, the second person of the Godhead, the Son of God, be called the Everlasting Father? Well, let's be clear on what Isaiah is not saying. He is not saying that Jesus is the Father, the first person of the Godhead. Isaiah isn't teaching us here that the second person of the Trinity is the same as the first person of the Trinity. You see, in in Trinitarian Orthodox theology, there is one God, three persons, but they're all distinct. So there's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. God the Father is not God the Son. God the Son is not God the Holy Spirit. Some uh, in the ancient and early church uh, believed in what was known as modalism, where, where, where the one God takes three different modes. So he can appear as God the Father, he can appear as God the Son, he can appear as God the Holy Spirit. And, and, and that is what is regarded as a heresy. It's not true. It's not orthodox belief. There is one God, three persons, same in substance, equal in power and glory, all co-eternal. But they're distinct. And what we need to understand here is Isaiah is not speaking of Jesus' role in the Godhead when he calls him everlasting father. Now what he's speaking of is his character and his purpose. So in previous weeks I've said, if we get hold of Jesus, the meaning of Jesus' names, we get hold of the character of Jesus, who Jesus truly is in terms of what he came to do. So Isaiah is saying here, when this child, this son will grow up and he will be fatherly in his character and purpose. Now, I want, to, I want to now get us to think, what does it mean for Jesus to be called Everlasting Father? We're going to really take most of the sermon thinking about Father, and then we'll, we'll touch on the, the, the term everlasting as we, as we get to the end. But here's my first question. What comes to your mind when you think of the character and attributes of a father? Or what should come to mind? Because I know some of us have had not a, pl- a gr- good or pleasant experience with our earthly fathers. Well, well, a good father protects, provides, guides, cares, loves, is involved, is intimate, is dependable, is dedicated, is generous, is gracious, is wise, knows when to say yes to us, knows when to say no to us, is tough and yet tender, is concerned and committed, Courageous and compassionate, forgiving and affirming, and sacrificial. To name just a a few of the characteristics of a, a good father. Now if we step back from all that I've just said there, we can see all of these characteristics in the life and ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ in the Gospels. Like in the Gospels, Jesus looked after his people. He was dedicated to his disciples. He provided for his followers. He, he led them. He guided them. He, he, he felt for them. So, so often we, we read of Jesus feeling compassion. That's love that's moved to action. And Jesus wasn't just concerned sometimes of them as, 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 as his followers as a, as a crowd, but he was concerned for them as individuals. He got really intimate with his followers at times, so he would take them aside. He would deal with them one to one. He was always tough on sin and yet tender on those who were sick or suffering. His love was pure and sincere. So so all of the characteristics we've just uh, mentioned, we see them embodied and personified in Jesus. In the psalm we sang earlier in the service, As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. And as I said, 
Compassion means love that's moved to action. If we can summarize Jesus and his coming into this world, that's what exactly it was. It was compassion that brought him here. He saw us lost, ho- helpless, hopeless. We, we, were, we lived our lives like sheep without a shepherd. And so he came to rescue us. And then there's that famous story that Jesus shared, the story of the prodigal son, and that reveals to us that the, the character of, of the Father, who is God. He saw his son who had squandered all of his inheritance and wild living and prostitutes, returning, and he ran towards him. He hugged him, embraced him. He forgave him and he showered him with all of the blessings of sonship. So, so when we think of Jesus, he, has, he is perfect in his father-like character. And, and in so many ways, right, this term father, it, it really reveals to us, not just his character, but the reason for his coming, his, his purpose. You see, Jesus actually came into this world to reveal to us God the Father, the first person of the Trinity, what he's like, his heart. Jesus came to make known God the Father for us. So, so I've said Jesus is not the Father, he's not the first person of the Trinity, but he did come into this world to make the Father known. So so we read in John chapter 1, verse 18, No one has ever seen God, the Father, but the only begotten, who is in the bosom of the Father. He has made him known. Or you remember, Jesus is in the upper room. It's told to us in John's gospel with his disciples. And Philip was struggling to understand how Jesus relates to the Father. And maybe like a little bit like us this morning, he asked Jesus, Lord, Show us the Father and it will be enough for us. And Jesus answered, Have I been with you so long and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe I am in the Father and the Father is in me? You see, Jesus came to reveal the Father. So Hebrews 1 verse 3, the Son is the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his being. Or Colossians 1 15, he is the image of the invisible God. Charles Haddon Spurgeon, the great preacher of the 19th century in London, summarized what we're thinking about right now really well. He said, how complex is the person of our Lord Jesus Christ? Almost in the same breath, the prophet calls him a child and a counsellor, a son and the everlasting father. This is no contradiction and to us scarcely a paradox, but it is a mighty marvel that he who was an infant should be at the same time infinite. He who was the man of sorrows should also be God over all, blessed forever. And that he who is in the divine trinity, always called the Son, should nevertheless be correctly called the everlasting Father. How forcibly this should remind us of the necessity of carefully studying and rightly understanding the person of our Lord Jesus Christ. We must not suppose that we shall understand him at a glance. A look will save the soul, but patient meditation alone can fill the mind with the knowledge of the Saviour. You see, as we we look at this term and it reveals to us his purpose, it requires that patient meditation. Now, now the other dimension where, where Jesus being called Father reveals his purpose is actually, as I said, the, the, the term Father can, can be used, especially in the ancient cultures, to, to refer to the kings, to their leaders. And, and, and Jesus' purpose was he, he came to reign and rule as a king. In fact, that's what Isaiah chapter 9 verse 7 reminds us of, of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom 
to establish it and uphold it with justice and righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. So Isaiah is saying regarding Jesus the Messiah that he has come to rule and reign. His reign will be forevermore. That's this aspect of him being everlasting. And he, as he comes to rule and reign, ushers in a, a reign filled with blessing, peace and righteousness. And of that there will be no end. So Jesus' purpose in coming is to, to rule and reign over his people, over his kingdom. So, so, so we've, we've thought about the, the, how Jesus embodies all of the characteristics of a good father. We've thought about how, how this term reveals the purpose in part of Jesus' coming. Now I want us to think about how does Jesus fulfill the title Father? Well, well I want to list a number of ways he does this. You see, Jesus fulfills it by being our federal, our covenant head. You see, in the Bible, we're told that there are only, in, in one sense, two men who, who represent the whole of humanity. The first Adam and the second Adam, meaning Adam and Jesus. So, so we have one of two fathers. And if we're in Adam, we get everything Adam did earned and deserves sin sin is what he did judgment is what he earns and deserves but if we're in Jesus we get everything he did he lived the perfect life because of his wrath absorbing death and his um, death defeating resurrection he opened up the way to eternal life. And Jesus, who, who, who has literally won all the, the victory over sin and Satan, means that he's procured for us all the blessings. And so if he is our father, he, if he's the one we put our faith and trust in, that is what we get. Our sin washed away, a robe of righteousness, meaning a perfect record and a glorious inheritance. But if you don't believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you remain in Adam, deserving all that Adam deserves for sin. So, so, so let me give you verses that, that, that explain this. First Corinthians 15, For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. Romans 5, 19, For as by the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. So, so Jesus fulfills this title by being our federal head, by being our second Adam. He also fulfills this title because he's the founder of our faith. So remember Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, Fix your eyes upon Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith. The, 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 literally the idea is he's the founder of our faith. How did he found our faith? Well, it tells us in verse 2, For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and then sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus is the Father, the everlasting Father, because he is the federal head and he is the founder of our faith. But then Jesus is our Father because it's in Jesus we find our adoption into the family of God. It's in Jesus we become children of God. You see, sin meant that we have all become orphans, alienated from God. Because of our first father, Adam, we inherited his nature. Meaning that we, 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 we live our lives in enmity with God. But Jesus, our second Adam, as our father came to secure our adoption. So John chapter 1 verse 12 says, To all who received him, Jesus, who believed in his name, God gives the right to become children of God. Uh, how do you become a, a child of God, adopted in his family? John says we believe, we trust ourselves to him. So the, the, the words of 1 John chapter 3, verse 1 are true of us. Behold, what manner of love is this that we should be called children of God? 
and so we are. And if, if we're going to feel the weight and the wonder of that text, it's because we who were once rebels, once orphans, alienated far from God, have now been brought near. We're now those who have the blessings. We're co-heirs with Christ. We have the privileges of Christ. Uh, Paul in Galatians puts it a different way. He says, When the fullness of time had come, at just the right time, God sent forth his son. So this is the reason why Jesus was born at Christmas. He was born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, so that, here's the purpose, so that we may receive adoption as sons. So that as orphans we might come into the family of God. So, so, so Jesus, he is our federal head. He's the founder of our faith. Jesus is the one who brings us into the family of faith. And Jesus then fulfills his title because, as we highlighted, the way he leads and guides. So in John chapter 10, verse 27, we, we read Jesus speaking as, as the, the shepherd king, as the leader of his flock. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. He guides us. He leads us with his words and his commands. And and so in Jesus, he he fulfills his title because he he leads us and guides us. But he also fulfills his title because he provides security and protection for us. So he says in that very same uh, verse, I give them eternal life. They shall never perish because no one will snatch them out of my hand. So Jesus is our Father who cares for us because he provides for us eternal security, eternal protection. Meaning that we'll never be abandoned, never be left alone. Because no one can snatch us from his hand. In Jesus we are safe. Nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So he fulfills his title by being our federal head, by being the founder of our faith. He, he fulfills his title by the very fact that he provides for us security and he leads us and he guides us. But he fulfills his title also in the sense that he makes a provision of a father in his death upon the cross, in his great sacrifice. On our behalf, greater love has no one than this, that he lays down his life for his friends. What sacrifice, what provision Jesus has made for us, his people. He's taken care of our greatest need, our sins. He's paid the penalty, taken the punishment so that you and I don't have to. How amazing is Jesus as our Father because he fulfills all that this title means. And then finally, we read that Jesus, in Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6, he is our everlasting Father. That is to say, he is our Father forever. He's the Father of eternity. Meaning, he is permanent. All of our earthly fathers will have to say their goodbyes. All of our earthly fathers die. But Jesus Christ is the eternal one, the everlasting one. So, so, so John speaks of him as the one who has no beginning. In the beginning, he was with God. He is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the one who is, who was, and who is to come. He is the one who is eternal. He inhabits eternity. And so he is our father forever. Many of us have known an experience where our father has failed us, has let us down. Jesus will never fail us, never disappoint us. He'll never forsake us. He'll never abandon us. He'll never leave us. He will be all that it means to be a father for us forever. So even if you've had a great experience of your earthly father, it's just a shadow of what Jesus is as our everlasting father. 
He will continue to provide, to protect forever and ever, to bless, to love. So, so as I conclude, we need to see that Jesus is the Father that we, we've all dreamt of. He, he's the best. He's incomparable, unrivaled as, as a leader. Right now, we, we look at our world leaders, and particularly in our country of Britain, and there's this whole crisis over Brexit, and then there's a crisis of the, the COVID situation. But we have a, a perfect leader in Jesus. And his rule and reign is marked by peace, and it's marked by righteousness and justice. So, so Jesus is the everlasting Father. He's the one who who meets all of our deep longings and our deep needs. Physical, emotional, spiritual. And so if you aren't yet someone who's put your faith and trust in Christ, I want to say, the Bible would say you're an orphan right now from the family of God. But you don't need to be any longer. Because if you believe in him and you believe in his name, He gives you the right to become a child of God. And if you are a Christian who who trusts in Jesus, know that he is your father forever. Perfect and permanent. He is full of love for you and he will always lead you. He is courageous and compassionate. And because of him, this Christmas, we can rest assured that we'll never be disappointed. Because he'll never let us down. He'll never let us go. He's holding us forever.
Now may the wisdom of the wonderful Counselor direct us, the strength of the mighty God protect us, the love of the everlasting Father embrace us, and the peace of the Prince of Peace surround us, this day and forevermore. And all God's people said, Go love your God.